The fivefold ministry grace to grow to maturity, Nicholas. The fivefold ministry grace to grow to maturity. And this is a, just a wonderful subject to be sharing on, to open up Ephesians 4.11 or even 4.7 to 16, that, that passage in which the revelation of the five ministries is given to us clearly. It's the only place where they're, where they're specifically set out. But there's much other teaching through the New Testament to help us understand those ministries. So God's goal for the church of Jesus Christ is for the church to grow into maturity. Amen? To come to perfection. The old version uses that word more, to come to perfection. And Ephesians 4, 7 to 16 is the only place in Scripture where the, the ministries are set out. What are the ministries? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher. I like to teach people to lift up their left hand Wiggle their thumb and say apostle. apostle. And point with their pointing finger and say prophet. prophet. And reach out with their longest finger and say evangelist. evangelist. And a lot of people wear a wedding ring on that finger. And so that's the pastor looking after the family. Pastor. And then put your little finger in your ear and say teacher. Yeah. yeah. He, get, he gets in your ear. Amen. There's a lot of revelation there. Look at your hand again. What's your thumb? It's the foundation of the hand. Can you imagine trying to function without a thumb? You wouldn't be able to get very you wouldn't get much right in your fingers if you didn't have a thumb. Amen? So a lot of people would starve. Without the five fold, without the apostles set in place, the, the the ministry cannot function properly and so the body starves. <laughs> Look at the other four, they all have to walk beside each other. But the apostles can have a face to face communion with each one helping them to be set in place and to function in the work of the ministry. Okay. Amen. God does it, but he does it through his ministries that he has given according to his grace. Hallelujah. So Ephesians 4, 7, where we're starting, says, But to each of us grace was given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So because Christ came, because Christ suffered and died and rose again, he he has released grace to all of us. He's, and, and so each member of the body of Christ has received grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. But then immediately then in verse 8, <coughs> the scripture says, Therefore he says, Quote, He ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. Now he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So suddenly the gift of Christ in verse 7 is become a a five-fold gift, or, or a gift, plural, in verse 8. It's now Christ ascending on high, taking captivity captive, and giving gifts to men. So Nicholas mentioned briefly at the table of the Lord about, about Jesus ascending on resurrection morning with his blood, and he went through the heavens. Hebrews suggests he was cleansing the heavens. So that from that time on, only those who came in Christ by the blood could enter into the Holy of Holies. That the way was now blocked to angels to, who weren't of God, demons, principalities, powers, they can never access the throne of God again. You, you, won't have ju you can't have um, Satan coming with, before God as in the book of Job and, and arguing about something. It cannot happen. You can only come to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. If there's some other way to come, he didn't need to die. But he did die, he needed to die. He gained for us this awesome victory. And so in, 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 in dying and rising again, he, he took, and then ascending, he took captivity captive. Now that's a bit of a mystery. What's captivity being taken captive look like? Well, speaking of those three days when Jesus is down below, where did he go? Down into hell, into the earth. And what did he do? Well, Peter says he preached to spirits in prison there. That's one of the things he did. Another thing he did, that when he rose, paradise rose out of that region and was taken up into heaven. So the saints of, of Old Testament were seen even walking in the streets of Jerusalem as they ascended. Mm. Hallelujah. And what else did Jesus do? The book of Revelation said he took from Satan the keys of hell and death. Amen. Amen. And... 
And Ephesians chapter, we're coming to it in a minute, verse 9 and 10, or verse 8 to 10, tells us that Jesus went down to bring up the gifts. Somehow or other the gifts had come into captivity to Satan, but now through Jesus Christ they've been released and restored. Hallelujah. So now God can fulfill his purpose by bringing forth this awesome mature church in the earth because all those five ministries release grace as they minister the word into the church. Hallelujah. We need all five. Consider, most of us have grown up in, in churches and we have a pastor. That's number four. In that church, maybe very occasionally, the pastors will bring in an evangelist from outside and we'll have some rallies and maybe even a citywide outreach. So we all experience the grace of the evangelist. That's a great grace. And, and most of our teachers are locked away in Bible schools because churches don't employ teachers, they just employ pastors. But I'm an exception because I was blessed in, in 1994 to be put on the, the staff of a church here in Toowoomba as a teacher. I was actually paid to teach the word. Hallelujah. I did pastoral work as well, but my primary appointment was for teaching. Hallelujah. And, you know, those of you who have been around for a while, we've, we've had prophets coming and going here and there. Some of them more profound and legitimate than others probably. But I, I've had a few good experiences with prophets. I've had a few uh, risky ones as well. But, but God, I knew God was restoring prophets. But in 1997, about September, <coughs> when God began to speak to my heart about the calling of the apostle, I didn't know any apostles. And I'd, I'd, I'd heard of one man calling himself an apostle from Rockhampton, but I didn't have any contact with him at that stage. And in the Christian bookshop, you could find no books on apostles. Now it seems that there's books being put regularly. In the last few weeks, I've had two different apostolic ministers in, in Queensland offered to me in, in book form and another one just look up his website so suddenly there's apostles information on apostles everywhere amen so so God raises and, and appoint, appoints and raises these ministries but we'll come back to that in a moment so through, through each of these ministries grace is released to the body of Christ I, that's right I was saying you know, the church the normal church has a pastor. Nick mentioned four different varieties of pastors yesterday. Senior pastor, associate pastor, a youth pastor, what was the other one? An assistant pastor. So there's all different forms of pastor, but wouldn't it be wonderful instead of having five pastors that we had apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers? Or that we, we, we made sure that our local church, our fellowship, was part of a citywide church where the ministries are received. Hallelujah. So in this session, I want to build in you the vision for his church, his body in the city, to, to be, to receive the fivefold ministers so we can grow to maturity. Cannot do it without any one of them. If one of them is missing, the church cannot grow to maturity because the Bible is clear. When Christ ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now let's look at verse 9 and 10. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So Jesus spent that critical time in, in hell, using hell in broad terms. And I um, and, uh, just want to show you quickly a verse in Acts chapter 2 when, when Peter's preaching, because I have heard some very erring messages about what happened to Jesus in hell, how the demons gave him a hard time and you know, the dog, the bulls of Bashan and the dogs were all encircling around him. And No, no, no. When Jesus went to hell, in what form did he go to hell? No longer a suffering servant. That all finished on the cross. 1 Peter 3, 18 says that he was made alive in the spirit. So by the spirit, so Jesus went in the spirit. He, he went in the form of God. Philippians 2, verse 6, as Nick says that, that he was in the form of God eternally. He thought it not robbery to be with God, but he humbled himself and came into this world as a little baby. Amen. And he humbled himself further and became a servant. And he humbled himself further and became obedient to death and even further to the death of the cross. But when Jesus went down into hell after, after dying on the cross, when he said it was finished, the Bible says he breathed his last, he breathed and the spirit left him. 
His spirit went out, he was dead. But the Holy Spirit came upon him and he's God. So he went down into hell as God. He went down into hell in the spirit of God. You think the demons can touch God? Hey, come on. And so I've even heard, heard strong people with a strong reputation preaching about how Jesus was, was tortured by the demons. It's a load of rubbish. Once Jesus had died, it was finished. And he was, he was made alive in the spirit. That's so important. From the moment Jesus expired on the cross, he was made alive in the spirit. He wasn't in the tomb. His body was in the tomb. But he was in, in general terms, Sheol, or in Hades. Amen. I wanted to go to that one in Acts 2. Peter is giving a brief bio of Jesus in verse 22. He says, that great man of God, verse 23, speaks of his, of his, of his uh, crucifixion. And then verse 24, Peter says, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. And that's the controversial phrase there. If you, if you have a New King James Bible with a, with a centre column for cross-references, it'll have a little two there, and you look under verse 24 in the, in the central column, and it says, literally, birth pangs. So Jesus wasn't suffering for death. He'd already suffered for death. He'd already died on the cross. He'd already been tortured in his body. He'd already been crucified on a tree, and he died. No, you know, who knows, like, if, if one of your relatives is suffering terribly with, a, with an incurable disease, and when they pass, what do you say? It's finished. The suffering's finished. You know, thank God, at last they're released now from the suffering. Amen? So once a person dies, there's no more suffering. I'm talking physically now, in the human condition. I'm not talking about where that soul goes. But, but the human person who's suffering terribly, the moment they die, we all say, oh, thank God. Mum's gone. She's, her suffering is over. Amen? So we need to listen to what we say, because we're actually saying great spiritual truths, or we're actually saying great spiritual errors. And so, so Peter said that Jesus was loosed from, the, from, literally, the birth pangs. So what, was, what were the birth pangs? What was Jesus birthing in hell? What was he doing for those three days? You intercessors, you ain't had nothing yet. You imagine Jesus down there in hell birthing a new creation. So that when he rose up, all the graves opened of the saints around about Jerusalem. And, and those people who were held in their soul bodies down in, down in Hades, in, 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 in what we find out was called paradise. So paradise then was below, but it's not below anymore. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, he went to paradise in the third heavens. Amen? So Jesus was birthing a new creation. Amen. And, and, and the pain of doing that was probably much more than even dying on the cross. Probably similar to what he, what he did in Gethsemane, which was more spiritual and, and psychic pain, psychological pain that he suffered there. That was greater probably than the physical pain of the, of the torture of the cross. But now he's, he's in hell, he's in Hades, and he's, and he's, he's, but then he's loosed from the birth pangs of bringing forth, and he rises up. Free. Amen. Okay. So we've established in other teaching that Jesus Christ himself is or was the fivefold. Amen. Jesus was the apostle. Hebrews 3 1 says, Consider the apostle, Jesus Christ. And yet, you know, most Christians don't bother. Most preachers don't bother to consider the apostle. But we, we are living in great days of restoration. For the last 23 years at least, this, this person's been considering the apostle and preaching. Hallelujah. You know, I was, I was, I was on a plane from, from um, what's the little island nation we used to go to? Mauritius on the way to Kenya. And God began to speak to me about Jesus the apostle. You know, I'd never seriously considered Hebrews 3, 1 before. I didn't have a confession of Jesus the apostle. But just on that couple of hours in that plane trip, God was just downloading to me the preaching, you know, they the, gave me a confession of Apostle Jesus. I've been preaching it ever since. It's so exciting, amen, amen, to know that Jesus is the Apostle of God. What does an Apostle do? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I'll build my church. Apostle builds, amen. And then 
I won't give you all the reference, but Jesus was recognised among many as the prophet that Moses had even prophesied of. Jesus was, was called, the, he called himself the good shepherd, he's the pastor. Nicodemus in John 3 called him the teacher who, who must have come from God because no one could do the things he was doing without being a, but he was a teacher. You know, teachers are meant to have signs and wonders, brethren. A teacher's not meant to be a dry old, you know, dusty experience with, with your old slates putting all the notes down. No, a, Jesus was a teacher and he was known as a teacher from God because of the signs that God was doing through him. And Jesus was the one who came to seek and to save the lost. He was the evangelist. So that's another whole teaching is of that in itself, looking at Jesus, the fivefold. So we've looked at Jesus, took, took captivity captive. So, so in other words, Jesus, Jesus totally wrapped up the authority of Satan. He, he totally rendered him unemployed, one brother said to us here the, a couple of years ago when he was preaching. That, that he's, uh, what were some of the other things he said? He, he's idle, I-D-L-E now. He's unemployed, he has no job. He's fired. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so why, did, why did Jesus give us this fivefold? Why did he go to all the trouble of taking captivity captive to give us the fivefold? And we won't even try to go into it, but the fivefold must have been in hell, locked up in death since, ever since Adam's sin. But Jesus had to go down there and then, he, and then as Ephesians uh, 4, 10 says, he, he rose up again. So he who descended is the same one who ascended. Far above. Far above. Thank you. Amen. Above that he might fill all things. all things. Amen. So why did Jesus give us the fivefold? So that he might fulfill, that he might fill all things. The church that's to be built through the ministries of the fivefold that Jesus has given through his death, burial and resurrection and ascension is given so that he might build, they might build this church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. How's he doing it? Through the fivefold ministers that he went down into hell to release back to the human race. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. So Jesus is building his church through the fivefold. Amen. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church which is represented as a building. We did some of that yesterday. He is the foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation from Isaiah 28.16. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.5 that we are living stones and we are built upon Jesus, the, the living stone himself to make up the walls of the temple of God. And then Ephesians 2.19-23 talk more about that building. And, and specifically mention that apostles and prophets in verse 20 are the foundation of the, of the building of the house of God. But that's not our subject today. Okay, so what's the purpose of the fivefold? Well, verse 12 gives us three, three answers. Ephesians 4.12 The modern versions want to say, for the equipping of the saints... For the works of service. And they want to make that one statement. The equipping of the saints for the works of service. My Bible says for the equipping of the saints. For the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. And then until. The old King James. Clearly makes it three things. For the equipping of the saints. comma, For the work of the ministry. comma, For the edifying of the body of Christ. And you'll see in a moment why that's so important. To not adopt the modern versions, but go back to the old King James to find out what's really being said. Otherwise we can miss the very purpose of these five ministries. And, like most, as most of the church does today, just ignore them. Oh yeah, I know about them, yeah. Yeah, I remember one senior minister having a yarn with me and, and he was sort of challenged me a bit about saying I'm an apostle. Well, I'd be telling a lie if I said I wasn't, because Jesus made me an apostle. And after he made me apostle, I still used to sign myself off Pastor Paul Galligan. And one day Jesus said to me, why are you telling lies? And I was shocked. I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, I've made you an apostle, but you keep calling yourself a pastor. So I repented and stopped doing that. You know I used to call myself a pastor? Because I knew that was acceptable. But I knew if I started calling myself apostle around Thumba, what would happen to me? 
And guess what? It happened to me. <laughs> but I had to be obedient to, to, to acknowledge the calling that Jesus had placed upon my life and the gift that he had Im- embedded in me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, so what, I want to read it this way for a moment. That Jesus gave these five ministries mentioned in verse 11 for the work of the ministry. See, when I was called to be an apostle, I was functioning as a teacher. I was doing seminars right across the spectrum of church, from Anglican to Pentecostal and everyone in between. And it was a wonderful time, going around doing weekend seminars here, there and everywhere, raising up a team, earning a living doing that. I really enjoyed it. But, when, but towards the end of the fourth year of that ministry, Jesus started to speak into my heart about the fivefold, and he said, that number one place is vacant. There's, yes, there's prophets around, there's pastors by the score, there's uh, teachers, there's evangelists, not very many, but there's a few here and there. But there's no apostles. That's how he showed me you know, that he was calling me to fill that vacancy. Amen. And uh, where was I done? Yes. And so if I had to just said to Jesus, well, no, uh, I'm quite happy being a teacher, Lord. I really like this ministry. I get to travel around the different towns, the churches, doing seminars. I get to stay in different houses. I get to experience all the good cooking of the ladies. I get paid a wage. And I'm able to take teams with me and raise them up. And and so we were prospering and doing well. So I could have argued with Jesus and said, I'd like you just to leave me as a teacher. Thanks, Lord. Well, you know, 23 years down the track, where would I be? Still wandering around Australia, teaching in a few churches here and there. But once I received the apostolic and accepted it, nations opened. Mm. You know, within, within a f- couple of months of accepting the call, I- I'm in the nation of Myanmar. And so, 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 the, yeah, so each of us needs to know, talking to ministers now, what our calling is. And be faithful to that calling. And God can change the calling. As we might see a little later when we look at Paul becoming an apostle. What was Paul before he was an apostle? The Bible clearly says he was a teacher. He and Barnabas were teaching for a whole year in the church that was growing up at Antioch. But then one day the five leaders of that church called certain prophets and teachers. So there were prophets and teachers recognised very early in the church. But they were having a time of ministry and seeking the Lord with fastings. And the Holy Spirit spoke to those five men, through one of them who was a prophet, no doubt, and said, separate unto me Saul and Barnabas for the work I've called them to. So the brothers continued in prayer, and then they laid hands on those two men and sent them out. And verse 4 says, and being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Paul's ministry changed from teacher to because it by twice in Acts 14 then, Paul has changed his name to Saul now, and Barnabas are referred to as... What did I say? Saul's name is changed to Paul. He's got the revelation of the name, like I have. And, 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 and he's called an apostle. So we know his ministry changed from teacher to apostle. What about Barnabas? Well, Barnabas was a prophet. He, his very name that the disciples gave him literally means son of the prophet. And, it, and, they, and they said it was a son of encouragement. Barnabas. Now, Nabi in, in both Hebrew and, and, and um, Arabic is, is prophet. So Barnabas was a prophet. So Paul calls a prophet and a teacher and gives them the gift of apostleship and sends them out together. Awesome. Amen. So there's a deep insight there. I remember years ago in Uganda, early in the century, in, in a pastor's meeting, about 30 or 40 men there, mainly men, and, and I was talking about the fivefold. And these guys all were going under the title of pastor because that's the only title that, the, that, that not only does the government recognise pastors generally, but the church. You go into church and say you're a prophet or an apostle, you might get tarred, teared and feathered. Amen? But if you're a pastor, that's okay. So... After the teaching of the seminar, I called all the, all the ministers forward to talk to them. And I said, and I taught them on the fivefold and said, now let me ask you, you're all going under the title of pastor, but what's the ministry in your heart? And you know, about a third of those ministers already recognised in their hearts that their calling was something else. That they were just marking time, being a pastor in a little local fellowship. 
Because some of them are called to be prophets. Some of them are called to be apostles. Some of them are called to be teachers. Some are called to be evangelists. You know, you meet a lot of evangelists, even in the, even in the West, who actually are pastors of churches. Why are they pastors of churches? Because again, no church will pay the wages of an evangelist. They just pay the wages of the pastor. And the pastor gets to control the finance. He's not going to share it with the evangelist or the teacher generally. And let alone the prophet and, and, and the apostle when they come along. Now this has all changed because, you know, we are very well supported as an apostolic ministry. We have people in many parts of Australia supporting us because they align with the vision we have and with the work we do. They can see we're doing exactly what the scripture says to do. Going out and making disciples of all nationalities. Baptising them into the name and teaching them. Amen. So, so, so these five, each of these five must do the work of the ministry for the church to be able to grow up into maturity. We all need to sit under apostles and receive that grace. We all need to receive a prophets and receive that grace. What, what, should be the, what should be a couple of ways to recognise the fruit of a, a prophetic ministry? Paul gives us three. He says encouragement, edification and consolation. That they're the three sort of effective working fruits or, or manifestations of the prophetic ministry. That they'll encourage people, they will build people up and they'll comfort people. Amen? I think that's 1 Corinthians 14, 3, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, many people in many churches are starved for teaching. And, and, and so to, to get your teaching, then you either go to Bible school or you just get on the net these days. And you end up dragging down whomsoever and getting full, filled with false doctrine because you've got nothing to judge it by. See, every congregation should be well taught in the Word. So if a false teacher, preacher, apostle or apostle comes along, uh-huh. <coughs> I'll try to tell this little story without any reference. You won't know who I'm talking about. But we had <coughs> a missionary person here with a great record as a missionary. And, um, and it, was about, it was in our Thursday ministry school. There was about 20 of us, maybe 25 here. And we asked this person to share. And this person started to share how he preaches to Muslims by telling them that God's like an egg. And everyone in the, in the meeting was shocked. And they all looked at me and they looked at Nick and I was looking at Nick and Imagine trying to tell a Muslim that God's like an egg. So one of they didn't cap, cap, uh, take their heads off for blasphemy. Imagine calling God an egg and trying to introduce God to Muslims. God's like an egg. You know, he's the shell, he's the white, he's the yolk. Oh, where is that in the Bible? Oh, it's not in the Bible, son. It's just a good way to explain. No, it's not. It's a wretched way to bring God down to say God is like an egg. And they've got a few other favourite analogies they use as well. You know, God's like water, steam and ice. No, he's not. God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That's who he is. If you can't adequately preach who God is from the Scriptures, you need to go back to Bible school or you need to become a disciple so you know the Word and you only speak the Word. If the Word won't convict a Muslim, don't think your story about an egg will. Amen. Come on. Amen. So these fivefold were given to do the work of the ministry. I need an apostle. I need a prophet. I need an evangelist. I need a pastor. I need a teacher to minister into my life. Amen. Hallelujah. And what, and what, what else? Is the, so the work of the ministry is what? Back to verse four, chapter 4 verse 12. To equip or perfect the saints. Now I'm going to read your word wealth that's in the Spiritual Life Bible. This is the Shiloh authorised version. And it's a word wealth under chapter 4, verse 12. It's called, it's, they translate the word here, equipping. It's a Greek word like katatismos. And it means a making fit, preparing, training, perfecting, making fully qualified for service. In classical language, the word is used for setting a bone during surgery. The great physician himself is now making all the necessary adjustments so the church will not be out of joint. Wow. So that, that little definition there has really helped me understand the work of the ministry. 
It's to set all the church in order, the saints in order, so they can all begin to function. Amen? They can all begin to do the work of the ministry. Now, some say, oh, so everyone's got to become either an apostle. No, no, no. But that grace of the apostle enables you to be apostolic. That grace of the prophet enables you to be prophetic. That grace of the pastor enables you to be a pastor. That grace of the teacher gets you well informed in the word and the grace of the evangelist. Who's ever been around an evangelist and all you want to do is start witnessing? You know, many years ago, a guy came up from Sydney to be with me for a while. I was the pastor of a regional sized church in town at that time. And, uh, and he, he just had the gift of evangelism. I took him to Brisbane. We pulled up for fuel. He got out of the car and went into the, went into the little place and I filled up my car and went into pay. And when I got in there, there he is with the, with the assistant in tears and leading her to Christ. He just couldn't help himself. We went down to Brisbane. We were visiting a few different pastors. We had lunch somewhere. And we had a, had a waitress a, 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 given to us at our table. Well, halfway through the meal, he's got her crying and, and coming to Christ. I mean, hanging around a is beautiful, amen? And it makes you want to do that. After he was here for a few days, I had to look him for every opportunity to tell people about Jesus. Didn't get anyone crying. <laughs> so we need each of the ministries to equip so, and set the church in order to function. Amen? So there should nobody be sitting in the church and wonder what I'm supposed to be doing. Amen? It should be clear if, if the ministries are working properly. But if you're guarding your little fellowship and not allowing prophets in, not allowing apostles in, not allowing teachers even in, then you'll never grow to maturity. Amen. And you'll give, have to give an account to Jesus. And then the other thing these ministries do is to build up or to edify the church. So we're back in the building analogy a bit and we've got to build up the church, the superstructure now. The foundations have been laid, but now we've got to build up the church to maturity. Amen? And we need those five ministers. So what are the, how do the ministries function? They're equipping or perfecting the saints and they're building up the body of Christ. Verse 13, until. So let's, let's look now at verse 13. Because from verse 13 to 16, I've called this the signposts of maturity. And what's the first one they get that Paul gives us? The unity of the faith. What's the second one? The knowledge of the Son of God. The third one, a perfect man. The fourth one, no longer children, but growing up. The fifth one, but growing up in all things into the head Christ. So we're up to number six, speaking the truth in love. I missed that one out. And then number seven, being that self-functioning body in agape love. Every joint supplying and every part doing its share, amen, for the upbuilding, the edification of the whole body of itself in love. Uh, imagine when the, uh, when the currency of the kingdom is love. Amen. You go to some church, you think the currency of the kingdom is money. You know, sow your seed here today. Oh, God will give you a, a hundredfold reward if you sow your seed. Oh. Now, money is not the currency of the kingdom. In fact, when they brought a coin to Jesus and said, Who's, you know, what do you think about this money? He said, whose inscription's on it? Yeah. Oh, Caesar. We'll give to Caesar what is his. So don't, don't make out that the currency of the kingdom is finance. The currency of the kingdom in Ephesians 4.16 is, is, is love, agape love. And I dare you to do a study on love, you, be, you might be shocked at how predominant the teaching on love is in the New Testament. Amen? Hallelujah. So, so these ministries are to continue until, until we all come to the unity of the faith. What could the unity of faith be talking about? Well, the Apostle Jude says in verse 3, that he was writing a letter to the brethren, and he said, I was going to write about this and that, but I felt necessary to write to you again to contend earnestly for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. So which faith is that? The teaching of the apostles, the apostolic faith. The faith that the apostles spread after Jesus went back to heaven and after the day of Pentecost. So they spread the faith everywhere. And in, in Jude, he refers that we must contend earnestly. That's a fairly aggressive stance, isn't it? Contend earnestly for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. 
Amen. What's another reference to this faith? Acts 2.42 says that those 3,000 who were baptised on the day of Pentecost, they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. So there's another expression of how do we come to know the faith. Matthew 28.19, teaching and observe all things that I've commanded you. That's the faith we're, we're, we're defending and standing up for. Amen. Which one? Yes, in Ephesians 4 verse 5, it says there is one faith. One faith. Amen. And uh, Titus 1.9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Brethren, stick with... Hey? That was Titus 1.9. And, and I just urge all of us, myself included, just stick with the word of God. Don't give in to having eschatologies and opinions about this, that and the other. Just let the word of God be the word of God. Amen? You didn't get saved because you, cause, cause you come to believe in, in creation rather than evolution. You didn't get saved because you didn't want to miss the rapture. I hope you didn't anyway. You know, why did, how did you get saved? You got saved because God called you. God touched your life. You know, I didn't, I didn't know any evangelists, pastors or teachers. But God started to draw me. God started to show up in my life. Amen? Amen. So we're looking at the unity of the faith. Just those three points will do. Well, Peter refers to it also in, I think Nick quoted this this morning, did you Nick? That no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. You know, why are there 144,000 schools of, of eschatology? Because people are interpreting the scriptures their way. Or somebody they watched on the television. No, brethren, just, if you don't know what the scripture says, don't ask someone else. Ask God. And wait for the answer. You know, Kevin Connor used to say, the late Kevin Connor, just put AFL on it. Not Australian Football League, but awaiting further light. Don't jump to any conclusion. Don't copy someone else's opinion. Amen? AFL. Who needs to put a few things under AFL? I'm sure we all do. We're waiting further light. Hmm. So the second thing that we're to come to is the knowledge of the Son of God. Hallelujah. And, and this is an amazing thing. You know, walking in the apostolic here with, with the company of people here and overseas, it's been an amazing journey. And we can point back to certain times when God released truth to us. And, um, and about 2007, I think it was, Nick, Nick was with a team of us, we were travelling, went to West Africa, went up to England, went across to America, home via Fiji. And, and I just started to get the revelation of 1 Timothy 3.16. For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world and received up into glory. Wow. So God was manifested in the flesh. Jesus. Who's that? That's Jesus. And so I, I started to get the revelation of what it means. See, when, when Jesus asked the apostles in Matthew 16, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him with a profound statement. He said, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, man, that's a revelation from heaven. Upon this rock I'll build my church. Amen. Upon this rock I'll build my church. Hallelujah. So, so, so since that time, 13 years ago now, we've been walking in an unfolding revelation of the Son of God. I haven't got time to go today, but if you write down Hebrews chapter 1, study it and see if you can come up with, I came up last night or this morning with, um, how many points? 18 points in Hebrews chapter 1 that, that helps me to know the Son of God. Paul says we're to come to the knowledge of the Son of God. Ah, hallelujah. There's even a little teaching brochure available downstairs on the revelation of the Son of God, which is just looking at Hebrews chapter 1. 
Do you know in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, the writer says, and to the Son he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Who does he say that to? The Son. And then in verse 10 he says to the Son, quoting directly from the Old Testament, and you, Lord in capital letters, you, Yahweh, have laid the foundation of the earth. Who is he talking to? The Son. Another verse he says, let the angels of God worship him. Who can be worshipped? Only God. But in that context it's worshipping the Son. What about the blind man in, in John chapter 9 who was healed by Jesus and, and got into trouble with the Pharisees and got thrown out of the synagogue? And in verse 35 says, and, and when they cast him out, Jesus came alongside him and said, Son, do you believe in the Son of God? Interesting question. And the young man had just been healed of, of lifetime blindness said, Lord, who is he that I might believe? And Jesus said, he's the one, you have seen him, and he's the one speaking to you. And the, and the ex-blind man said, Lord, I believe, and worshipped him. Amen. The disciples were in the boat, purposely sent there by Jesus. They, Jesus allows a storm to rage for hours, and at three o'clock in the morning he comes walking on the water. They thought he was a ghost, they're all scared. And if you dig in carefully there and look up a, a a Greek in the linear, you'll find that Jesus didn't say, it is I. He said, I am. He pronounced the name of God. And that's what gave Peter the faith to say, Lord, if you are, cause me to come and walk on the water. And Peter started to walk on the water, got his eyes off Jesus, started to sink. The Bible says immediately Jesus saved him. He might have been 20 or 50 metres away, but immediately in a split second, he's there saving Peter. And then the scripture says, and when they got back into the boat, who's in the boat? The rest of the disciples. The Bible says they worshipped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. And so dear brethren, and those who are hearing this message, wherever you are, we're still in those days of restoring, bringing the church up to the knowledge of the son of God. You know, the greatest issue I see moving around as an apostle is the lack of the knowledge of the son of God. Amen. Lack of revelation of who Jesus is. It's profound, it's wonderful, it's life changing. Amen. 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 The third thing in verse 13 that, that the work of the, of the five ministries is to do is to bring forth a perfect man in the earth. This is a fully functioning body. This is a corporate man. The body of Christ is to become a, mat a mature man, in inverted commas, conformed to the image of his son. Because if, we, if we're that perfect man, what will people see? Jesus. They'll see Jesus. Amen? And they'll have to recognise whether they're saved or not that truly God sent Jesus Christ into the earth to reveal God to us, to make him known, excuse me, and to build the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So we've had a fair bit of preaching already in this school on that stature of the fullness of Christ being the church. Then in verse 14, Paul says that we should no longer be children. I believe that's actually babies there, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually no longer babies. He's saying the church has to stop being babies. Amen. And the writer of the Hebrews brings the same accusation in Hebrews 5, verse 12 and 13, where he says, for though by this time, speaking to the congregation, you ought to be teachers. You know that God's expectation is for every believer to be discipled so they can teach others. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and one, uh, 2 Peter 2, 2 sums it up. We've been following this verse now for a number of years. Paul says to Timothy, that which you've received from me, you now impart to faithful men. And I put women in there as well. It's a non-sexist statement. Because, you know, often the Greek word for man is actually, it, it's, literally, it's more literally mankind or humankind because it's the Greek word anthropos, which simply means a human being. So, so the, the maleness of, 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 of men and male in, in the New Testament is often not a gender statement at all. It's just a reference to mankind. It's anthropos, which means both. Male and female, as God meant from the very beginning. Amen? And you also probably know that the first mentions of Adam in the Bible are not talking about his first name. 
They're talking about the family of man. So Mr. and Mrs. Adam, if you like. It was God, God created Adam. He, if you look up his name, yeah, it's very interesting. Hebrews, what is it, Lum? You're doing 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 2. That you impart the faithful men who, and women who will teach others also. So there's this apostolic succession. The apostle trains up a group of ministers. The ministers then train up another group of ministers who go out and teach. And, and, and the ones they teach, they get it. And so they should then continue to teach. So we're try- seeking to establish this principle in all of our apostolic schools in many nations that the purpose of the apostolic school is for you to be able to send out men and women who will be faithful to teach others. That they'll walk as disciples. They'll walk in the revelation of the word. Not in the revelation of what our denomination teaches or what some, what some great teacher teaches but walk in the revelation of the word. Eh? We had an African man here many years ago. He's gone to heaven now. But he taught us a little song. He said, and he taught it in Swahili as well as English, but only speak the word. Only speak the word. Only speak the word. Jesus only spoke the word. Amen. Would you like to argue with Jesus and say, oh, Jesus, as far as I'm concerned, Mark, Mark chapter chapter." Chapter 16, verses 8 to 20 is not in the Bible, so I just ripped it out of mine. Is that okay, Jesus? No, my brother. Only speak the word. Don't believe these modern translation people who say, oh, that's not the Bible. Oh, that, that, then we'll take that scripture out. I, whenever people show me a Bible, I, I say to them, am I allowed to check this Bible to see if it's genuine? I have at least three or four little keys. I just look for that verse, and I see, now look at this. They bolted that. Look at this. And sometimes even... I did find in, in, in Spanish, ashamedly, Alberto, that one of our brothers, who you don't think so highly of, he had, he had a Bible and it was left out. Matthew, Mark chapter 20, us 16, finished at verse 7. In that Bible. It was blank. Anyway, I won't get into that. That's another big subject and it's not my subject today. But what am I talking about? Yes, no longer children. Uh, for though by this time you ought to be teachers you have needed someone to teach you again the fundamental principles of the oracles of God so that whole Hebrew church no matter how many years they've been in Christ there, Paul's finding them all guilty of not being able to teach in, in the verse before he says I wanted to tell you some deeper things about Melchizedek but I can't because you become dull of hearing. When we lose the cutting edge of the teaching of the word of God we become dull of hearing. And so we can't receive the revelation of the mysteries we start to receive something else instead. Yeah. And with the internet now you can have your choice every day. You can find a different, if you don't, don't like it, find another one. Oh I like what he says, oh I got sick of him. Find another one. No, study the word of God. Study to show yourself approved. Rightly dividing. Every saint is to be a disciple and then able to minister the word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we should? Yes. But rather, speaking the truth in love. Now that's a good challenge, isn't it? Uh, put, put, have a little hearing aid on when you're talking to other people privately. To some of the things that you say, that I say, we're to, we're to be speaking the truth in love, not gossiping, not passing judgment, amen, but speaking the truth in love. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, number seven, I'm up to Nick, I don't know where you're up to. Growing up in all aspects or in all things into Christ. So, to so Christ is the yardstick. Christ is the plummet stone. You following what I'm talking about? The yardstick is the measuring rod. The, the plummet stone is how you, how you get the vertical perfection in, in the building you're building. Christ is all of that. Amen. He's, he's, the plum, he's the plummet stone. He's the yardstick. We are measured by Christ. We're to grow up in all aspects, all things into Christ, who is the head. Hallelujah. Amen. And then number eight, the final one, God's love revealed in the mature church. 
Ephesians 4 verse 16. I'll read it. From whom the whole body joined, joined to whom? To each other in Christ. Joined to, and knit together. Knit together, that's fairly close knitting. I was watching one of the saints yesterday in the meeting doing a bit of knitting as they were listening. And I thought, how do their fingers do what they're doing? I've never been able to knit, you see. So I was quite intrigued for a while, but it did distract me to get my mind back on the teacher. But we're knit together. We're knit together by what every joint supplies. Now, since, since we started RMA 23 years ago, I've just wanted to be a, a working joint because every joint supplies. So if I'm an effective joint, I can release from this part of the body into that part and vice versa. And so we need lots of joints restored in the body. Who agrees? Amen. You know, a lot of the body is pretty crusty, pretty boring really, and caught in, caught in, in rabbit warrens and, and caves because we're, we're, we're lacking the five ministries. And it's been my, my goal in my heart to, to, be, to raise up an effective joint so that whatever we receive will be released. Amen? That we won't be building up our doctrine. You know, our mission statement simply says, it's Matthew 28, 18 to 20. That's our mission statement. What's our vision? Oh, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Oh, what's that? Going and making disciples of all nationalities, baptizing them into the name, teaching them everything. Amen? So for 23 years, we've been going about the work of discipleship. It's been tough. We've had to learn a lot. Because as I said earlier, there was no apostle to teach me. We were pioneers. We went underground for the first five years of the ministry really. And then really continued underground up until a couple of years ago. When, when God started to coax us back out. Hallelujah. And that's the reason why a few of you are here today. Because God wanted us to join the body in Tumba. We're not one of many churches in Tumba. We are part of the one body. Amen. Amen. And so this, this verse 16 is a power, it, it's work by which every, and so every joint supplying according to the effective working by which each part does its share. And this causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Amen. So if we're joined and knit together, what's that sound like to you? True unity. Amen. Not, not our attempt to be unified, but because we're submitting to God, because we're receiving the ministries, we find ourselves knit together. Amen? And hallelujah. We've just had a marvellous uh, prayer meeting in the house here this morning, and, and brethren from other church fellowships in town came along. And, and it's almost it's like there's, a, there's true unity coming in that meeting, because it's the Holy Spirit himself. And we're all, we're all getting our eyes fixed on him. It's just amazing. Hallelujah. Because it works. True unity is, it, it, it's the fruit of receiving the fivefold ministry. Each part and every joint, every joint are able to fully cooperate and function, supplying life to every other part for the upholding of the whole body. Amen. All of this life flows from the head, our Lord Jesus Christ. And who, who could sense that in the prayer meeting this morning? That there's a, God was streaming down on us. Amen. I went to the bathroom at one point and you're all into... I think you were sort of... A lot of praying in tongues, I think. But I just thought, hallelujah, that's... Now I can hear God. Because the voice of God is like many waters. And it sounded... And it was a beautiful sound. It was many waters. I thought, my God, you're doing something wonderful in Twomba today. Because there's a river flowing at Shiloh, which has got nothing to do with Shiloh, but to do with the individual body of people coming together to worship God and, and to seek to, to the will of God and pray the will of God. Amen. To honour each other in that atmosphere. Hallelujah. And so I, I said to myself, this is, this is the sound of God's voice. It's like water. Beautiful, melodious. Hmm. So in conclusion... We are the house of God. Hebrews 3.6 says that, um, that Christ is the son over his own house whose house we are. Say we are the house of God. And we've been dealing with this quite a bit. Yesterday I talked on the building, the, the picture of the church as a building. And, and just pointing out, you know, 
So many people still talk of the church as that building, wherever it is, or that holy meeting place. But what did Jesus say? When two or three of you meet at McDonald's, although McDonald's won't let you meet there anymore, so you have to find another place. The coffee club, eh, Rob? At the coffee club, there am I in the midst of you. Amen? You see, that as we grow to be the church, we are the church wherever we are. So we are the church in the coffee club. If we manage to go to the, to the cafe on the park up here, we're the church in Park House Cafe. We're the church in the supermarket. Nick, Nick was in America a few years ago around Christmas time and he went into the supermarket and... and, uh, and what? Jesus loves you. Yeah, he told the checkout lady, Jesus loved him. Listen, my friend, you can't talk about Jesus in the supermarket. Supermarket's a supermarket, come on. And what did you say then? I just said, I talk about Jesus everywhere. I talk about Jesus everywhere. We are the church. We are the house of God. And Jesus Christ is the son over God's house. And he, according to Isaiah, uh, Zechariah 6.12, he, who is also called the branch, he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Ephesians 4, 8 again. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Why did he give these gifts? To build the church. Jesus said, I'll build my church and he's still building it today. Hallelujah. And you can't hurry him along. He won't give you the permit for maturity or perfection if you haven't done the foundations properly. And so a lot of our work as apostolic ministries is to go around the country and the world checking foundations. And uh, in the early years of the ministry, late 90s, I uh, did a lot of work in Myanmar in Asia. And everywhere I went, I used to ask ministers, college students, whatever they were, what are the six foundational principles listed in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2? And all I'd get was a blank look. Nobody knew them. The ministers didn't know, the, the brethren didn't know. Until I got right up in Kachin State on the Chinese border, and I was in a, in a big home which was actually a boarding college for village students to attend school in the town because there's no school in the village. I think it was particularly high school. And so their parents would send them into the town and so this ministry had built a big, had a big house as a boarding house for Christian students from the villages. And, they, and we, so we were ministering there for a day or two and the first day they were all out of school when I arrived and when they came home, I asked them, who can tell me the six foundational principles from Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. And you know what? These students said them off by heart. I was blessed and astounded. But in the far north of Myanmar, in, in, a, in a state where there were military everywhere because they just stopped warring with the Kachin people, my pap papers were checked three times in one, in one town in one day to make sure I was legit. They sent, they sent their police along in my meetings to make sure I didn't preach politics at all because this was very sensitive days in Myanmar when it was ruled by a military junta and uh, you could get arrested if you mentioned politics but anyway these students in, in the college and I said who, 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 how do you know that oh our bible teacher taught us and next thing Luke the bible teacher walks in lovely Burmese man or, or Kachin man and I said man this is great and you know in that place I, I witnessed the greatest Pentecostal outpouring over half because these students w were well founded in the faith and in the word you know, I was with another pastor from New South Wales who said Paul we need to lay hands on them and we began laying hands on these high school students you know and the Holy Spirit fell on them there, there was one girl about 13 or 14 lying on the floor on her back and everybody who touched her she had eyes closed everybody who touched her she prophesied over. But she even prophesied over some of them in English so I could understand. And she couldn't speak English. There was another girl stood up against the wall like a crucifixion stance. And, and she began to prophesy. And then Luke's, Luke's um, another girl, she started to sing songs. So this guy Luke I mentioned, he said, he was a muser, I was really sat down with his guitar beside her and started to put, play her songs so he could remember them later. And I said to myself, this is like the upper room. I won't be surprised if someone comes up and asks what's happening. I'd hardly said it, and there's this big this male stranger at the door, and he said to me, what's going on here? <laughs> he said, I was just walking by, and I felt to come up and find out what's going on. Now, unfortunately, we had to leave in, in the height of that 
outpouring that day. We weren't allowed to stay in that town by regulation. So, 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 so what's my, what am I saying? That God blessed those, those Christian leaders and those students because they had thoroughly laid the foundations of the oracles of God. Those foundational principles mentioned in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, in verse, in verse 12 of Hebrews 5, they are called the basic principles of the oracles of God. If we're going to understand the oracles of God, if we're going to receive the knowledge of the mysteries, and the New Testament is full of mysteries, we need to be properly founded. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, I was expecting you to. I think, I think Matthew knows them, and I think Bethy knows them. So, number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Number six. If you do these things, God will give you the permit to go on to perfection. God bless you. Amen. Amen.